See, I didn't realise how in-depth it was and how satanic it was and how bad it is. I'm just a guy from Glasgow who's kind of, everyone just kind of falling in my path just now where I can't turn my back for people exposing some of these gruesome crimes. That, like Barbara O'Hare last week who was involved in the Aston Hall where yeah, yeah. doctors were drugging the kids, raping them, killing them as young as 12. It, it, it goes on. You can take Beach Home, Shirley Oaks. You know, there's a whole plethora of these, these care homes everywhere, all across the country, you know, and they, they got shut down and they just morphed into private concerns and it still carries on to this day. Mm. But, I mean, Shirley Oaks was a big care home in South London and they had 19 known paedophiles. And then you get deeper, you get into the fact that who is behind this, who's sanctioning this, and you've got to look at who were the cabinet ministers that were for child welfare, and then you realise that they're dirty as well. I mean, the last five prime ministers, they all have what they call PAs. They're not personal assistants, they're political advisors. Every one of these PAs, you know, right the way back down to Thatcher and beyond that, had involvement with child pornography, either downloading or child abuse investigations against them. Every single one. You know, I mean, there was one guy, I think his name was Patrick Rock. He might have been uh, either Tony Blair's or Cameron's PA. He was caught with thousands and thousands of images, right? Child abuse images. And um, I think it might have been Cameron. Cameron put him in charge of internet security. And, and, it, and it's dark and it's dirty. And it, it, honestly, you, you've got to look at who either attacks you or who backs you. And um, there your answer is. But mm-hmm. it, it's well established. It's been going on for a long, long time. And if we look at our criminal justice system, I don't mean to domineer anything here, James, but, um, you know, back in 2003, they brought in the Bad Character Act in the UK, which says that anyone who had um, a propensity for a certain type of criminality, it could be brought in during the trial. Years ago, they couldn't on the whole do it until they were convicted or acquitted. Right. And people thought, oh, it's a massive leap, leap forward. But one of the things they kept tarnishing people with was dishonesty. You're a man of dishonesty, a woman of dishonesty. And that was offences of theft, right? Shoplifting or whatever. It's dishonest crime. But when you say the word dishonest, you instantly think liar, liar, liar. They knew this was coming out on massive scale. They knew it. This bit of legislation, in my opinion, was brought in to attack victims and survivors. And they could also not only use criminal convictions, but they could use reports from schools or care homes. So when these kids were reporting these abuses in right and i want to touch on what you said about this aston hall in the schools that they were told they were liars a report was made this kid is a liar a fantasist right and if it went on what they would do to the kids is they would then say right if you carry on lying you'll end up where the liars go and it'd be next door so these care homes kids homes next door would be the mental institutions where they would section them and they never got out Mm -hmm. And I know one girl, she's a, a campaigner for us, and she walked in, she'd been abused in her home herself, but she'd walked in on a little six-year-old girl being raped by one of the night porters. She went and told the housemaster, who they used to call uncles and aunties, to give it a homely thing. And when she did that, they sectioned her, 11 years old, for life. Oh. She managed to get out, and they never managed to get back. Well, that was the thing with Barbara over here. They said, she said there was a checklist Kids from broken homes, um, personality disorders, homeless, um, kids who who never had parents because if they take them into a mental institute, they sign them off as crazy. So if they run to the police, they wouldn't believe them. Well, no one's coming for them either. No one's going to come and get them. Mm -hmm. And and this is one of the things when I, and we'll get onto it, um, the timeline thing, but when... I looked at what was going on. I realised that a lot of these children were what they call missing persons. So when they go, thousands of kids go missing every day. They do, but they do turn up. But what they don't do is debrief these children and say, what are you doing when you're going missing? Now, I I worked in one one, um, department for for child abuse. And I said when I moved there, and this was not too far away from here. We're in East London at the moment. And I said to my sergeant, on my first day, are there any problems with um, children involved with prostitution? But no, not at all. We've had an officer that looked into it for two years, never one case. I got uh, a fax sent through from social services, sent through to me within 10 minutes of starting there, and I rung up the first care home and I said, excuse me, you know, I told them who I was, how many kids go missing from your home every week? They said, we, we usually use out about five kids. The average number is five kids. We lose three. I said, come on, cars on the table, what happens to them? They picked up, take the brothels. So within 10 minutes, I found three kids. By the end of 
uh, five days, I'd found 50 children. Whereas before then, in, and child prostitution, and people don't like that term, but it is what it is, right? If you don't look for it, it ain't there. It, it's hidden, it's gone away, you know? And it's it, this will one day be a national disgrace. And then what goes with that? Depression, suicidal issues, self-harming, diseases, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction. You know, you can't go in any sort of long-term drug rehab centre and not find that, that a good percentage have come from a very damaged background, uh -huh. childhood background. Yeah, it's, um, it is all connected, but I think something's coming to a head. I think you look at the Prince Andrew scandal, you look at the Epstein, for that to be getting airtime as well, and for him to even do a Prince Andrew, to even do an interview, shows you that pressure must be getting put on somewhere. Of course, and, and, and you can see the arrogance of them because that interview was appalling. I think anyone who's got half a modicum of intelligence will realise it was a farce. But again, you just got to look at, at this shower of scum that they are. I mean, his brother, Prince Charles... I mean, I knew one guy that was a protection officer for, for that family. He said, he's just weird. You, you go near him and he, he shakes away. But he was protecting for 14 years Bishop uh, Peter Ball, who was a bishop for, I think it was down in Eastbourne, in Sussex. And um, he was abusing kids in his care. He was raping them, basically. And one of them committed suicide. He was protected by the Archbishop George Carey, who is now Lord George Carey. And then when the police did have the balls to go and do something about it years later, numerous victims later, scores of victims later, and a suicide later, they found letters to uh, Bishop Ball from Prince Charles denigrating victims, saying that they're wretched individuals, they're liars, how dare they defame your name, when it was categorically proved that Bishop Ball was a very active, sadistic paedophile. So we got Prince Charles protecting this bloke, housing him for 14 years, and now we've got his brother that is involved with a 14-year-old girl. The man is a paedophile and has been for a very, very long time. And these islands always crop up in child abuse inquiries because oh. once you're on an island, where are you going to go? Yeah, you're stuck, you're stuck yeah. there. It's like you're, you're dead anyway yeah. as soon as you're there. Because if you look at the Jimmy Savile as well, remember the royal family are the most powerful family in the world. So the intelligence must be so high where they must do background checks to know people's... Oh, and Jimmy Savile had that. He was marked with that card for so many years, but yet it went undetected. James, if I went for a job, and I got this job with the police, and it was a field intelligence officer, but I was dealing with... And intelligence is graded, and it starts off with um, sensitive. And they've got little colour codes, so they have a little yellow label, sensitive, and then it'll be a green label, will mean highly sensitive. And then it'll go all the way up to a red label, which will mean top secret. And you have to be vetted according to your access to that information. And I was to get access to uh, um, top secret information for this job. So they said, right, you've got to go for vetting, high level vetting. And when I went there, I went for an interview. Uh, you know, they wanted to make sure I was mentally okay to deal with the job. Psychometrically testing me. And then they said, right, we've got to know your whole internet history. Are you involved in, in um, watching internet porn? Are you involved in, in swingers? You know, and in online dating was a big one. They said, you'll probably, if you're on online dating, you will fail vetting. And it was really funny because it was um, a woman, a detective, right, a lesbian woman. She said, if you're homosexual, you probably won't get the job either. I said, well, in this day and age, she said, this preordains, this goes way above, you know, uh, political correctness because there's a, you, you're going to have a propensity for more sexual partners and there's going to be more scope for bribery. Right, so bearing that in mind, I mean, even I was engaged at the time to a, a Lithuanian girl and they wanted to know about all her, all her family as well. And her father had been in prison in Russia and they, need, they, they got everything. So they really did a proper job. So that was vetting to deal with top secret information. So how the hell can people like Leon Britton, right? Leon Britton, who's now deceased, the former Home Secretary, have got the fastest ever promoted Home Secretary we've ever had and the youngest, right, after Winston Churchill, get to that level when he had a propensity for young boys. How the hell did Jimmy Savile, when the intelligent... If, what we know, right, there's a world difference between proof and truth. Right, when you're in the police, this is why my campaign for police whistleblowers is so important, because police whistleblowers, police know everything. Right, we have access to the files and we have access to intelligence. And when people read in the paper, oh, oh look, so and so's been let off, he didn't do it, you know, there's been a few celebrities, again, mindful of liable laws, right? But then you read the police intelligence, they've been at it for a long, long time. We've got the highest burden of proof anywhere in the world, 
right, beyond all reasonable doubt, and to prosecute a, a historic child abuse case, 2% success rate. So all that stacked against you, you know, you really got to know your stuff to in order to get a prosecution. But just because someone gets a not guilty or they don't even get charged doesn't mean they didn't do it. Yeah. So when you look at all this information, you sit there and you realise these people are cropping up. We, you know, my mates still ring me every now and then, ex-colleagues, and say, so-and-so, do you remember him cropping up on a report or her cropping up on a report? And they've all been out here. And what I will say to people that watch this, right, whatever you see in the newspapers and all that, you know, and they get off with it, there's always more to it, always more to it. You know, and the fact that even the police are sniffing around them, alarm bells should ring. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Savile um, was well at it for a long, long time. You know, so, and having access to the royal family, that guy would have been vetted. And and not only that, people like Ted Heath, people like Leon Britton and, and, and Lord Janner, they would have had what they call prot officers, protection officers, following them about. Where are they? Where is, where is their, their voice? Um, I was given details of two officers, which I then went and I passed on indirectly via a cabinet minister to the Home Secretary. And these are two officers that were um, on guard at Downing Street. They were protection officers for Ted Heath back in the day. And um, three times a week when Ted Heath was in residence at Downing Street, a car would pull up in the early hours of the morning, two, midnight to 2 a.m., and young eight-year-old boys were produced, one boy at a time, and they were taken, you know, via a, a series of security checks, right, into his residence, and the door would be shut. And they both said to each other, we can't have this. They knew, clever lads knew, that if they mentioned anything, the sword of Damocles would come down like it did on me, you know, and it comes down hard. So they actually accosted Ted Heath in person. And they said, right, sir, we need to talk. We need to talk now. They said, we want to talk in your room. He went in the room and they said, it stops. And it stops today. And the lad said, actually, it did stop for two weeks. But then they were moved. And then they were pensioned off. They took early retirement, full pensions, bang, off they went. 